<laughs> over here now. <laughs> Where'd he go? Hey, Eddie. Hi, right, Bill. How are you? So we can take these off now? I think so. Yeah. Six Nobody out here. Township manager just left, so. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular meeting for Monday, July 13th of the Board of Commissioners. Mr. Burma, would you please call the roll? Mr. D'Amelio. Here. Mr. Oliva. Here. Mr. McCluskey. Here. Mr. Siegel. Mr. Siegel's here, but on Zoom. Can we hear you, Mr. Siegel? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Mr. Lewis. Here. Mr. Quinn. Here. Dr. Hart. Here. I think Mr. Holmes is pulling into the parking lot right now. And Mr. Wexler. Here. Please stand and join our chief in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. For those that may be watching this on TV, the meeting tonight consists of all the commissioners. Eight of us are here in the room, socially distanced. Hence, we'll take off the mask if you'd like. It's up to you. Uh, we set the room up so that you would be an acceptable social distance from any other person, and you'd have no nearness for any uh, air bubbles or water there. So if you see us without a mask in the public, that's why we, we are separated in the room. Mr. Siegel is attending remotely via Zoom. And this is the first meeting that we've had. One of our questions tonight is when we've there. We have been meeting via Zoom during the pandemic since March. And this is our first in-person meeting for us. And the public is invited to watch on cable TV and have submitted comments via email for our public forum. At this time, I'd like to ask the township auditor for his update. That feels good to be back. I reviewed the expenses and warrants for this meeting. I found no irregularities and all my questions were answered to my satisfaction. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Next item is a citizens forum, it's, which is normally 20 minutes of registered speakers and 20 minutes for agenda items. I have at least three items. One is the first one is from Mr. Anthony Morinelli, which is as, a, as usual, a rather lengthy comment. His, his title is entitled Public Comment. It says, again, I find that I must put forth a serious concern for the neglected Caracon Creek. Indeed, that it is necessary to bring the environmental needs of the creek area to the attention of the township is indicative of the chronic neglect of our most beautiful natural gift. One would think that this board, of its own direction and interest, might attend to the maintenance of our greatest natural resource. Caracon Creek is the birthplace of Haverford Township. The mills that once lined its banks provide the flour, lumber, clothing, gunpowder, and military uniforms of the 18th and 19th century. The powder House, the last vestige of the mills, has been left to slowly decay and crumble. It had received no care, no attention. There is not one marker, one sign, one suggestion of the mill's past and their role in the founding of this township. Caracon Creek is not even listed as a township park. No agency, no commission, no society has shown any evidence of concern for the creek, its environment, or its history. Caracon Creek has, until last year, when some few members of this community began attending to its restoration, been ignored. The creek is overgrown with knotweed, porcelain vine, and other invasives. Along with the creek, the property called Haverford Mountain 
home to several unique indigenous species, is also under threat. Again, no agency, no ecological group, no commission or society has shown interest or taken action to curtail the spread of the devastating growths. Beneath the blanket of invasives hide beautiful and delicate native plants and flowers from wild blueberries to a distinct variety of azalea. <clears throat> While some of the area around Mill Road has been cleared by volunteers in this postal code of Haverford Township, the number of concerned and active volunteers is too few to take on the task of the full creek bed and, and the mountain. Beyond the pressing need to control the invasives, the creek area is also plagued with lanternfly nymphs, which cluster on all, almost every branch and stem. And again, what action has been taken? Requests for the simple materials to tape and wire trap the trees have been completely ignored, ignored by a township that claims concern for the environment. Caracon Creek and Haverford Mountain are the most exquisite natural gifts in Haverford Township. The creek offers an unparalleled emotional, intellectual, and physical experience for adults and for children. Many make use of the drive for Sunday walks, and children often play in the creek, but the walkers and the children in all likelihood benefit from the, drivers, from the drive's natural beauty without awareness of Karakong's history or ecology. Indeed, as they stroll and play, they do notice that the views of the creek and the powder house are obstructed by unbridled invasive growth. The cascading water is not even visible from the drive. As commissioners, it is incumbent for this body to invest time and interest in the restoration and maintenance of Karakong as a historical and environmental heritage. I might also ask the members of this board when last they visited the creek or when, if ever, they climbed to the top of Haverford Mountain. When they have taken a moment to witness the condition of the powder house, have the members of this board ever seen the old mill intakes or the remains of, some of the stone dam walls? Have they seen the natural springs that issue from the rocks on the far side of the creek? Are they even familiar with our history? How much would it take for the township department to clear the knotweed before it flowers and sets seed? Cutting over four or five years is the only alternative to chemicals. If two or three volunteers can clear a full area with simple hand tools, how much more efficient would township workers be with proper power tools? It seems that the Harriford Reserve does not lack for attention. How is it the Karakong is ignored except for the mowing along the periphery, a mowing which would not have occurred without prompting? How much longer must the creek wait? How long will this township's commissioners and directors delay any action? It has already been too long, but not so long as that some red remedy may begin. Celebrate our history and our natural environment. Karakong has waited too long. Tony Morinelli, Harford Hall, Mill Road. He's also enclosed a couple of pictures along the street. We'll pass those. So we'll pass those out among the commissioners. Our second public comment is from Mitchell Cron of 2928 Morris Road. His comment is, when will all the township boards and commissions resume formal meeting activity? Is there a specific date or a specific set of metrics that are being consulted to evaluate this? If so, please share what those are. If some boards and commissions are currently meeting during the pandemic, which ones and why? Why are all boards and commissioners, commissions not meeting via Zoom? Third comment is from Mr. Anthony Lazario, Lazaro, 117 Sycamore Road. I am a resident of Havertown and was wondering what the township's plan was to combat the lanternfly. They are everywhere and especially in parks. We have missed the opportunity to use tree bands. We are all concerned. Thank you. I'll answer the last one first. I'll ask Mr. Berman if you have any comments on the lanternfly. Yes, Mr. Wexler. I think you remember last year, um, I think it was late summer, early fall, where I gave a presentation and talked to the board about the spotted lantern fly and the fact that we knew that it was encroaching and going to be arriving here in Haverford Township. And we talked about some of the things that residents could do to combat the spotted lantern fly. We talked about the fact that the spotted lantern fly, when it arrived, would be here for a long period of time and that 
there was little we could do to eradicate the spotted lanternfly, but there were things that residents could do to slow the spread. And so we talked about the things that you can do, and the resident who uh, gave you that comment talked about the uh, banding of trees, which is uh, certainly an option early in the spring and summer months when the nymphs first hatch and residents can put bands around trees. But we have to be careful when we're putting bands around trees that we don't inadvertently kill off some of the important insects and other animals like birds that sometimes get trapped on those bands. And so it's recommended that residents, when they put those bands up, can use uh, chicken wire or some other material that will allow the, the traps to capture the spotted lanternfly nymphs as they climb up the tree, but it won't result in the uh, death of some of those more valuable insects and other animals that we don't want to kill off. We also talked about the removal of the tree of heaven. It's an invasive species of, of uh, vegetation that would be appropriate for residents to uh, go ahead and remove from their properties. Likewise, the township has taken some action in some of the township facilities, uh, some of our park properties, to begin to take some of those bands and also to analyze some of the tree of heaven that we could remove ourselves. Insecticides. Um, when used appropriately, insecticides can be an effective and safe way to reduce lanternfly populations. We rely on the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and the Penn State Extension for a lot of information about the spotted lanternfly and how to deal with the spotted lanternfly. The Penn State Extension is researching which, which insecticides would be best for controlling the pest, but preliminary results show insecticides with certain ingredients are more effective than others. However, as always, when you're using an insecticide, there are safety, environmental, and sometimes regulatory concerns that we have to worry about. And so we have to weigh the pros and cons, and they're recommending seeking professional assistance. So we've talked about the spotted lanternfly. We provided information to the residents and to the board, and we have done some, uh, some work in our parks. However, as you know, we're proud of our park and recreation system, but it's a vast system, and we have enough crew to do certain amounts of work with the lawn mowing and the vegetation control and the taking care of our parks and recreation facilities. But we certainly don't have enough to treat every single park and all of the trees throughout the township for the spotted lanternfly at this time. Thank you. Bill, could I just add yeah. uh, one of the other hats? I, I am a master gardener for the um, Penn State Extension. And the uh, Penn State has been, this is three years actually, uh, and every year has gotten worse. They are not recommending, one, I think residents need to understand that for their yards, the spotter lanternfly isn't really a threat unless they have um, grapes or they had a lot of young um, trees that generally they're not gonna do a lot of damage. The concern, the biggest concern for spotter lanternfly is what they can do long-term to fruit crops in the state. So that's the, the reason we're trying to control it. Um, the bands that Mr. Berman described are infective. Nymphs, as we move later in, now the, the nymphs, the next stage, they're sort of reddish. And then when we see the adults, those bands won't work if they fly. And there are sort of different types of traps that you can, if you go to Penn State Extension, you can see other traps you can use. It's too big. Of, uh, they're experimenting with some fungicides to see if, but at this point, actually, they're recommending caution that people shouldn't be using a lot of insecticides, that you're going to end up killing pollinators and beneficial insects. And so um, the bands are great. These other things are great. But one, you know, they're everywhere. We can only do so much to control them. But isn't, isn't part of the problem also, even if you were to use some insecticide or some deter to uh, deter um, the, the spotted lan lantern flight. Um, the problem is, I mean, if your neighbor's not doing it, uh, well, it they're, all they're, over they're, the they're, they're coming back to your property anyway. Right. Yeah, they're they coming back into the park, property. so as soon as you spray, they're coming back because not everybody's right. is doing the same thing. So I think there, it's, it's uh, kind of an impossible task. Okay. Did you hear, somebody told me today that you could use vinegar and dishwashing? Did you hear that? Um, there, there's things, if you go to Penn State Extension, there's things to use. Um, a lot of people use Dawn soap. They're not recommending that, that they can um, 
harm. Um, there are so insecticidal soaps that they recommend. They're pretty safe to use. You need to keep using them. <clears throat> but a lot of the things that the homemade red remedies can do damage to other insects that we want to keep. Mm. The bottom line, check the Penn State advisor. Yeah, Penn State Extension has a lot of information. Okay, great. Thank you, Doctor. Second comment, Mr. Berman, you may as well just stay there. Uh, uh, the Township Boards and Commissions. We have been meeting. The, bo the Board of Commissioners has met every month via Zoom, uh, to Mr. Crone's comment. Planning and Historical Society and Zoning are also meeting. Uh, planning and Historical have met in person uh, because they have a legal requirement to keep projects going. Uh, zoning is meeting in person, social distancing. Let me just clarify for you. The Planning Commission and the Historical Commission have met under guidelines through Zoom, and they've done so because, as you say, they're legally required to do so under uh, the Municipalities Planning Code, for example, to continue projects. Historical Commission, in this case, met to provide guidance and recommendations to the uh, building code official and the zoning officer with regard to an historical property that was being renovated for uh, for commerce, uh, a restaurant, and the um, zoning hearing board is the one board that has met in person because they felt, as a, as a board, they felt that it was better to meet in person because they conduct hearings that could later be appealed to the court of common pleas. Correct. And then our other committees have met, they're all volunteer advisory committees for the most part. Uh, Parks has probably been meeting, correct, via Zoom, I guess? Yeah. So the Parks Board has been made. That's our major other advisory board. The senior citizens, I do not think, most of those people have been concerned, and rightfully so. And since they're an advisory board on uh, senior citizen matters, they have not met. But just about everyone is using Zoom. Uh, we do follow the state guidelines and the CDC guidelines that the state adheres to. So they, they are what we're doing. We're trying. We have maintained business as usual throughout the township, I think, in a very professional manner. So, Mr. Morinelli's comments about the uh, carrot concrete. That's uh, I'm not the expert, but uh, I'm open to suggestions. If there's any help we can give from the township, I don't I don't know if we consider it a park or not. But uh, it it is a, a natural resource. If there's I will say I, I'm I'm a little surprised at the timing because what we're trying to do um, with with all of our residents is to work with them to try and do the work. Uh, that they're asking us to do. And in fact, our park maintenance crew spent a full day down at Karakung this past week and cleared uh, a big area of vegetation, uh, the, the knotweed. And so we're working with Mr. Morinelli the best we can to uh, accomplish what he would like us to do, uh, albeit it's not going to clear the entire Karakung Creek right. and the whole drive, but we're doing what we can. Great. And we'll stay, we'll do as much as we can without sacrificing other parks. Fair. Our next item on the agenda is commissioner committee update. So are there any? I know Actually, the police... Bill, can I just add to what Dave said? We, um, Brian Barrett and myself, met with uh, someone from Darby Creek Valley Association about a plan to start. If we just remove the knotweed and you don't put something else in, you're going to have erosion, which is going to right. damage the creek. So sort of a long-term plan to start to remove, eradicate the knotweed, but then also to replace it with more native plants. It's, that's a long-term process. We were supposed to get started in spring. Other things happened this spring, um, but it's, it's still on the agenda. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Any committee updates? Yes, uh, Mr. President. Really? Um, the police committee, which consists of myself, uh, Commissioner Quinn, Commissioner Hart, and Commissioner McCluskey met with uh, Chief and the Deputy Chief, obviously, to discuss uh, what happened with uh, Mr. Floyd and what we can do to ensure that that never happens here. So uh, I want to thank the Chief and the Deputy Chief, uh, Joe Hagan. And the police have eight points that the Chief will go over that the Haverford Township Police Department is currently uh, going to utilize or is utilizing. Thank you. <clears throat> and minutes were submitted to uh, Dave, who submitted the email, the, the minutes to the board. Yes, they were very good. Thank you for those. Which contained these uh, eight points. Chief? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
So, commissioners, uh, you have the, the uh, up update that we have for some of our directives and what we have started to do as a result of the uh, unrest in, in the country. So as you, as you see and go down the list of things, the banning the choke holds and strangle holds, we completely ban them except if an officer's life is in danger. And that's pretty much across the board what's recommended. Obviously, uh, when an officer is, is in a life-threatening position, he has to do anything to save his life or somebody else's life. But um, for use in an arrest or to subdue a person, it is absolutely not permitted. Uh, we had this uh, a little weaker uh, terms in our uh, in our um, directive, so we, we beat that up uh, to make them uh, not not allowed at all. Uh, required de-escalation. Um, we've been doing de-escalation de de training for quite some time now, but I'll, I'll tell you a little story that happened the other day. We had a, a uh, possible suicide attempt during the day. Uh, a very big gentleman in the township. Uh, he was outside. His, his father and his wife had called, and it was really... Uh, a very difficult situation. He was outside the house and he was all over the place, up and down, up and down. And you could see him getting more and more tense. We felt it was going to erupt. Uh, five officers were there uh, in a matter of 45 minutes. They calmed him down where he agreed to go to the hospital with, on a self-committal um, with just conversation between the officers and just working through it. So. I wish I could have that video for everybody to see because you can truly appreciate what the police officers did. Obviously, we can't share that because it's, it's not a, a criminal matter, uh, but uh, it, it was very, very encouraging and enlightening to see that our officers have their react in a situation like that. I was there. I witnessed the whole thing, and they did an excellent job. Um, require warning before shooting, <clears throat> and, and this has been in our directives in, in, in a different form, uh, but this is a difficult situation. Uh, uh, use of force is always, always difficult. It's always something we'll always go back and review, uh, but a warning has to be issued before. Uh, exhaust all their means before shooting, and obviously uh, no police officer wants to fire a gun and take somebody's life. And I'm sure they will use any other means to, to uh, bring that uh, person under arrest. So do we intervene? Now, this, this is the, the newest one we have, uh, and we've been talking about this for a little while. We didn't write this ourselves. We borrowed it. Looks like every other police department would borrow it. Uh, we to try not to in, reinvent the wheel. Uh, we, we talked to uh, other chiefs in Delaware County who had just uh, initiated this. We took this ch change a little bit to benefit or make it available for our, our uh, officers. So as you can see and read this, we'll make this available to uh, anyone once, once uh, this goes, uh, we're finished with the meeting. Um, so the duty to intervene is very, very important. If an officer sees another officer doing something that, that he feels is, is dangerous or illegal, he has a duty to intervene, uh, whether it be a, a chief officer, a lieutenant, or a subordinate officer. They have to uh, intervene there. Uh, banned shooting of moving vehicles, uh, that's been around for quite some time. Uh, required a use of force continuum, we've always had that. It's just re we're upgrading the training again. And the comprehensive reporting, which we have been doing, uh, when there's an incident that needs a report and bumped up the uh, chain of command. So these are things that we, we've been doing. We just beefed it up a little bit more, reviewed it, and it had given additional training. Also, we, we, our Joe Hagan, Deputy Chief, <coughs> reached out to uh, Dr. Whitehead, who's the principal of Chatham Park School. Um, he came in here and spoke to uh, every officer in, in roll call. Um, he's, he's a gentleman, he's, he's black, he's started the Delaware County resident, uh, and just to tell his take on what it's like growing up black in Delaware County in, in, in the world. And it was very well received, a lot of give and take with the officers, and this is the kind of interaction we try and get instead of bringing somebody in to just, here's a program, uh, I'm going to teach it to you, to actually have a conversation with somebody who lived this, who's respecting the community, who's in, in one of the local schools, knows Haverford Township, knows a lot of our officers. So it's, it's very well received. We thank Dr. Whitehead uh, for, for coming and taking care of that for us. So that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Chief. Anybody, does it, thank anybody you. want to bring up anything? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other committee? Uh, yes. Um, we had a meeting of the, the ad hoc committee uh, to look at possible uses of the Brookline School um, last month and where their next meeting will be Monday July 27th at 6 30 we'll maybe try to do the next one on zoom if people want to participate great thank you very much
July 27th via Zoom. Any other committee updates? Our next item is the Township Manager's update. Mr. Berman. So we've talked a little bit about the economic impact of COVID-19 here in the Township and how can residents help. And as the board knows, we've been doing a no contact food collection uh, and taking that food to local food banks right here in Haverford Township so that we can support our own residents. Um, just so the board's aware, back in uh, May, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Statistics did report the uh, updated unemployment rate for Haverford Township at 9.5%. And that means that about 2,500 residents were out of work out of a total labor force of about 27,000. And so that's a big number, and that's why we're trying to do the things we are. Um, last week, over 110 residents participated. They donated food uh, to our non-perishable food items, uh, to our non-perishable food item collection, and it's held at the CREC. We're gonna continue to do that, and it's on Wednesdays from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., and then again in the afternoons from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And that's being um, managed, overseen by uh, two of our parks employees, uh, Kirsten Taylor and Jesse Hart. And we're very grateful to those employees for doing that for us. Um, we also had a no contact drop off shredding event this past Saturday. And to our surprise, the staff that were there, it was incredibly successful. There were over 300 cars that came through on Saturday morning, and we were shredding, uh, we did shred in the trucks that were there, about 15,000 pounds of paper. And so that paper shredded, and then it's taken for recycling. So uh, we're very happy with that. Um, next part of my report is to introduce Amy Cuthbertson, our Assistant Township Manager and Finance Director, and she's gonna talk a little about, it, about the reassessment at the county level and the impact here in Haverford Township. Everybody. It's nice to see you all in person again. So the reassessment that the county is presently in the midst of, I know, is, is creating you know, anxiety for some residents. So we wanted to share the information we had and the information we've learned since we did a presentation back in March. So just to review some of the basics. This is a countywide court-ordered process under the direction of the Board of Assessment. It will go into effect January of 2021. 20, January of 2021 for their township and county bill, your school bill will not be impacted until July of 2021. So the bill you just got from the school district is based on the current assessments. Uh, preliminary evaluation letters were sent to residents in March, and then <coughs> everybody should have received their final valuation as of earlier this month. The value assigned should represent what you could sell your property for as of July of 2019, and that is countywide. So the figure you're looking at on your assessment form should represent market value as of July of 2019. Uh, each taxing authority, county school and township will need to reset their current millage before approving any tax increases for 2021. Um, this is a, a, a somewhat confusing concept because people see their assessment and think, oh my goodness, the assessment tripled, my taxes are going to triple. Um, that is not the case, and the, this concept of resetting the current rate before any increase for 2021, each taxing district is going to have to go through that process. I'm gonna show you an example of how we're going through it. Um, also, just for residents to know, um, there is a limit of tax increases following a reassessment. That's a statutory increase, and it's limited to 10% in the year following a reassessment. Amy, I'm sorry. Is that just us, or is it the school district, too? Or? The school district follows different rules um, regarding the gaming, commerce, and things like that. They have different limitations that are much lower than ours, but that's for county and township limits. Thank you. What is that 10%? Is that on the taxing authority, or? Nobody whose assessment went up. On the rate, 10% increase in rate. So once we reset it, if the rate goes to four mills, we can only increase that by an additional 10%. Oh. Okay. So what we have learned since the last time I spoke is uh, we were able to obtain the preliminary values as of March. 
So the values everybody got in March, we were able to obtain our township-wide total. And as I explained the last time and tried to reiterate, uh, we can't reset our rate until we got that township-wide total. So while this is preliminary, and if I had bells and whistles and horns, I would be flashing that on the word preliminary, um, this does uh, give a sense of what we can expect, and it is helpful as an estimating tool as residents are looking at what the financial impact of this may or may not be. Um, also of interest, and this was in the letter to everyone, the appeal period has been extended until September 1st. So anybody who, after looking at their assessment and comparing it to market values, if they really feel it's out of whack, they have until September 1st to file the appeal paperwork with the county. Okay. Those appeals will be in-person and remote. I believe um, property owners are going to be given the uh, choice as to what they would prefer to do, since some will not be comfortable going to the courthouse, and they can opt for the remote option. Amy, can I ask you, um, it's up, uh, so our approximation is 6.4 billion? Yes, right? so we currently were at 3.2 billion. So do we know how, how we stand relative to other uh, townships? No, we, we don't have countywide information. All I was able to obtain was our information. So that went up. A, when will you have that? The other. Uh, it's at the at the um, mercy of the county when they distribute it. They had said originally um, late fall. Yeah. So we might not be getting that for so a little while. So if our if our overall assessment, our value, uh, is higher relative to other townships and municipalities in the county. It would also impact you can, our county tax. You can, you can expect a probably a higher percentage increase in your county taxes versus your school. I, and, I would expect Haverford and, to be one of the higher valued municipalities in the county. So, so you'd pay, uh, probably if you look at your overall tax bill, you pay a higher percentage increase in your county portion of the tax bill versus your school district in the township. That's what we're expecting based yeah. on these preliminary numbers. Okay. And while they are preliminary and not final, again, if I had bells and whistles, I'd be saying it 10 times, but I do think this is a useful tool. It's a useful tool just for people to try and get a sense of what they're, they might be looking at. So what else we learned was using those preliminary values, what we did was we got a, a data dump of raw data and I tried to extrapolate out any commercial properties, things like that. So 43% of the residential properties in the township were either at or below the 103%. So those folks are going to either see a stable, stable tax or a little lower. And 57% uh, were above. So those folks are going to see an increase. Some will be minimal increase and some won't be a minimal increase. That's depending on how far away you are from the 103%. If your property went up 200%, then you're going to see a more sizable increase than somebody that went up 105 percent. Okay. So, do you have any sense of what actual percentage increase kind of range you might expect if you're if you had a doubling or tripling of your assessment? Is there any? Can you say is it a range of it's six, really going, six to ten percent? Or could I don't you, want to pinpoint it, a percentage and then have people rely on that. So, what you'll see in the next slide is when I reset the the rate using these preliminary values. You'll see what the new theoretical um, millage would have been, and people can take their new assessment and multiply it and do the math themselves at home, and they would see what the impact would be, okay? Um, once we receive the final values, we will have to redo this entire exercise again, um, but like I said, I do think this is useful with the preliminary numbers just to give a sense of what people would be facing. So I call this an educated estimate of the impact of reset. So again, um, this chart shows what we currently build at our current millage rate of 8.487. <clears throat> we build $26.7 million in tax. The reset column is just showing the exercise into what would the millage rate be with the new assessment, but still billing the same amount of tax. This is a common misconception that we're seeing with residents who are calling. A lot of people think that um, this is a money maker for the township or the, the county. It's not. As, as I tried to show in the example, um, we are only permitted to bill the same amount of revenues that we were under the old assessments. 
So the rate will go down. If the assessment went up, the rate will go down. So using the preliminary numbers, you'll see our tax rate would theoretically go from an 8.487 that it is now to a 4.180. And like I said, what folks can do at home is take their assessment that they have on their letter, multiply it by the 4.180, divide by 1,000 since it's mills, and you'd come up with your taxes, theoretical. And again, this is just to use as a tool so people can see a sense of what the impact would be on their township taxes. Okay. So that they can project um, probably what their school bill is going to be as well. Cause that's as a 70, rule of that's thumb, you could go three seven, times on the 70 school. 70% of mm -hmm. the tax bill, right? You could, or three times. I would go three times your township to give an approximation of your school. Mm -hmm. This would also be before any increase is considered as part of the 2021 budget, okay? And that is, um, that definitely has to be a separate vote, like we're always used to doing, but statutorily it says that, that any increase above has to be a vote by the Board of Commissioners, which like I said, you're used to doing, so that's nothing new for us here in Haverford Township. So hopefully that gives, that can give everybody a sense once they go back and do the math. We can do it for you also. If any resident needs help with that, you can call the finance department and we'd be happy to, to help. But again, this is preliminary. This is just to give a sense, uh, give people a tool as everyone decides whether they need to appeal or not, whether financially or the market value. Um, a word on the uh, appeal process. And I can just say what we learned, um, there was a meeting of all the tax collectors in the county back in February before COVID started, um, where they explained the process. Um, they did encourage residents to have um, concrete evidence, whether it be appraisals or comp sales, or you know they mentioned some sites online that you can see um, actual sale history and things like that. Um, they did not feel, while it's within every property owner's right to bring whatever evidence they want to to, to plead their case, um, they did not feel that just saying, uh, my neighbor has the same house as I do and he told me he's 20,000 less than me. So they said that was not going to be sufficient, that especially in Haverford Township, all of our properties are so unique and they, they you know, in lot size and what might look the same on the outside is not necessarily the same on the inside. So. So neighbor sales are really not, I'm sorry, neighbor values are really not going to be a strong piece of evidence and they're more looking for comp sales. And if you can find that a house on your block that's the, pretty much the same as yours sold last year for a value that's much lower than what is on your valuation, that would be a good piece of evidence to bring, okay? Um, so you, oh, I've lost you. Oh. Amy, I've been asked, um, by a number of residents if they can find out what their neighbor's um, reassessment was. Is that public um, knowledge? That is not public information from the county. We obtained it uh, through a right to know request. Um, so if someone did need that information, we are by law required to uh, share it. So somebody could call our office and get that information. Okay. Um, I did put out another right to know request for final values just because we do get calls and we know people are anxious about what the financial impact of this could be. So we're trying to get as much information as we can for people, but um, they are not ready to um, give that out. They said probably next month that um, the right to know request could be answered. But, but over time, the county website will be updated with all these yes, values. Yes, yes, absolutely. So it will be the county does a as really it's, as yeah. it's completed it will be public the county has a really good website right now where they have a lot of public access information so i'm sure as that becomes available they'll put that out there as it gets but just right now it's not and i understand their position they don't want to put out too much information while this appeal process is still going on because you know things are still not set in stone until that appeal process the issue is though done. is that's something that people want to Exactly. I know. I know. As much as they discourage using your neighbor across the street, it, it's just natural that everybody wants to use that comparison. How do you file an effective appeal without having that information? Um, you so, use you the other more concrete methods which, of supporting your case, which would be either appraisals or comp sales, not just comp values by your neighbor. You would actually use sales from July of 2019. It, but the more, uh, the more fundamental question or the bottom line question is, 
is your house, what your ha what was your house worth as of July 1, 2019? Mm -hmm. If it was worth more than what it was appraised for, or your assessment revealed, then you're probably not going to win, win an appeal. Right. And if it, if, if it appraised for, uh, maybe your assessment was was over, mm -hmm. but your market value was, then you then you, you have a, might have a case for for winning that assessment appeal. Yeah, I that, think anything from a third party and or an actual sale or other valuation would just weigh much heavier than coming with just, you know, my neighbor told me his was 20,000 less than mine, yeah. so I want mine reduced, okay? Um, so again, if you didn't receive your valuation, which uh, we got a call today from a resident who hadn't received it, uh, please call the Board of Assessment. That is the number that's listed on their letter that's listed on the slide. Can you actually get through now? Uh, I can't promise. I, I've heard <laughs> mixed reviews. <laughs> um, but I'm sure that I know they're working, they're working on as hard as they can. Uh, if you feel your property is overvalued, uh, please follow the procedure and file the appeal. The, I guess the worst they can say is no. So if you really feel your case is strong and whatever evidence you have, the worst they can say is no, that it's staying the same. Um, as I mentioned before, please be prepared to bring what they instructed us to be concrete evidence, comp sales, appraisals, things like that. Um, neighborhood comparisons were not going to be looked at strongly. And the county has been very good. They have information out on their website as well as the appeal form. So that's all there at uh, delcopa.gov for everybody to see. So, is there any You don't have any a sense of how many uh, appeals have been filed, do you? I do not, no. I know we got ourselves uh, a very good amount of phone calls as to what to do and, and things like that. So I would think, and I would also think that Haverford probably saw a, a sizable increase overall for countywide, so I would think there's going to be a lot of appeals. And as we saw, 57% of our residents are above our average, so I think a lot of people saw a sizable increase. Hi. Is the township going to participate as an interested party in the appeals? Um, we usually let the school district follow or hold the lead since they have a bigger stance in these appeals. That's typical. Um, none of us have been through a, a reassessment of this side, or at least me and my cohorts in the school district and things have not been through this before, so we may actively participate more than we normally do. Um, I also should say that the township and any taxing authority, the county and the school, also have the right to appeal any property value that we see that is out of whack. We do have some data metrics that we're running right now. Um, we are not going to be looking at Every 18,000, every one of the 18,000 properties, and you know, nitpicking. But if we do see some, a real anomaly, um, either the township, the school district, or the county also has the right to appeal as the taxing authority. And do you have to set your? Do we have to set the township rates after the appeals are over? Um, reset the rates or set the rates formally for 2021? The second. The second. We, yeah. Um, typically, we get our formal assessment in November of each year. That's historically the way it's been, and that's how we, what we use to budget. So I'm assuming we will have that figure um, before you finally adopt a budget, but we'll probably be estimating leading up to that, and the preliminary budget will be an estimate. But it, it typically is. I am hoping we have a better sense of what these final numbers are, um, at least most of them. Maybe there'll still be some appeals still out there waiting to be decided, but I, I think we'll have a much better sense of the final numbers on which to, to budget semi-accurately. So the consequence of that would be that if there's a, if there's a very, if, depending on the result, a very robust appeal period, mm -hmm. the, the over 6.4 billion could drop. Yes, and then the millage would go up because we're still Start try, we still the millage would go back. Mm -hmm. Let's yes. be clear. Um, yes, so not not an increase. It would go back towards right now. One hundred three percent, depending on what happens with appeals, mm -hmm. it could be it, it could fall below one hundred percent. Right by one hundred percent, we could double. Yes, but as soon as we get some additional information that hopefully uh, would arrive mid August. Um, we can share whatever right. more additional information we have and go through this exercise again just to it might be too late at that point for appeals, but at least it'll you know people will know what they're to expect. Well, at least 
mid August, just not too late. Those are September one. September one. Mm -hmm. And is it a? Is it just simply note your, your, your appealing, and it's just at your appeal is what you need to bring. Down, yes. Bring. Yes. You you file the paperwork. It used to be a pretty easy form. I'm sure the form hasn't changed much. Just property address. You as the owner. Why you you know you as the owner. You're you're standing to appeal, and then you'll be assigned a hearing date. I think on this form you'll be able to, like I mentioned earlier, uh, select either a remote hearing or an in-person hearing, and they're typically held at the courthouse. And the, the assessments have been based on the notion of a truer comparison, a, 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 a truer evaluation of the market value of your home. Yes. So if somebody has received an assessment that is a number they've never seen and never dreamed of for their home, that's, um, that's the best grounds to, 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 to appeal. I mean, some people are going to appeal because they're going to do the quick math and mm -hmm. see the taxes are going up. That's not reason. Well, that's not grounds. That's not supposed to be successful grounds right. for appeal. Is that right? That's what we've learned, but I, I think it's everybody's right to, to try. If you feel you have a, a good case, whatever your reasons are, the most they can say is no. Right. But what you suggest is to get the best empirical data from a third party source. I do that compares your market assessment in July of 2019 from independent sources as your best tool. I do. Any other question? Amy, thank you very much. Okay. Great explanation and good update. Are you going to publish this? I have the March presentation on our website, and I can put this right along with it. That would be great. You know what I meant to ask before. Are we, are we published? Are the police, police publishing the two-page statement? Yes. Get up on Great. Okay. Thank you, Amy. You're done? That okay. concludes. Item seven is the approval of minutes of the regular Mr. meeting. Mr. President, I'd like to make a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes of June 8th, 2020. Second. Motion made and seconded by Commissioner Oliva. Any questions, additions, deletions, corrections? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio? Yes. Mr. Oliva? Yes. Mr. McCluskey? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Dr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. Item eight is the approval of warrants. Mr. Holmes. Mr. President, I move we approve warrant number seven of 2020, totaling $4,678,741.31. Uh, comprising the general and store fund payroll for June 11, 2020, in the amount of $1,016,842.04. The general and store fund payroll for June 25, 2020, excuse me, in the amount of $717,294.98. General and store fund payroll for July 9, 2020, in the amount of $608,730.98. <coughs> General fund disbursements for seven of 2020, out of $1,627,864.85. Sewer fund disbursement number seven, in the amount of $464,310.82. Community development block grant fund disbursement for seven of 2020, in the amount of $155,014.91. Capital project fund disbursement number seven of 2020 in the amount of $72,268.37. The credit card statement ending June 27, 2020 in the amount of $16,414.36. Second. Motion made and second. Any questions? I trust our auditor has. Um, it Oh, I wasn't here. I apologize. So our auditor has uh, reviewed these warrants and uh, any questions that uh, these warrants raised, he raised to our township staff, and I believe they were answered to his satisfaction. And I recommend we approve them. I just have one question. The credit card statement seems unusually high this month. 
usually that's the recreation and other things. So I'm, I'm assuming there's a good reason. There, there was. <laughs> there was a large um, computer purchase for uh, okay. probably 20 or 25 computers purchased for staff. Um, our IT department got a very okay. good deal, and that's that's why it kind of ah, is a little higher. The thirty high new month. computers, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. Great, thank you for that answer. But we don't carry the balance; we just use it, and then yep, we use the credit cards. We pay them off every month. Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio? Yes. Mr. Oliva? Yes. Mr. McCluskey? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Dr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item number nine is ordinance P16 to 2020. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to authorize it to, to enter an easement agreement for portion of the property located on Old Westchester Park Road for the use by Aqua Pennsylvania Incorporated. Second. Motion made and seconded by Mr. Lewis. Any questions? This is the second reading. We had the explanation last month. Any other questions? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item 10 is ordinance P17-2020. First reading. Uh, Mr. President, a motion to adopt the first reading of ordinance number P17-2020, authorizing tra traffic restrictions on the following highway. Establish special purpose parking in front of 436 Brookline Boulevard and in front of 23 West Wilmont Avenue. And also to rescind highway close to certain vehicles, road place from Manoa Road to Upper Darby Township Line. Second. Motion made and second. Any questions? Yeah, just why, I'm curious, just out of curiosity, why are we sending highway uh, um, close to certain vehicles? Okay. I don't know, Chief, I could do it if you want. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Grove Place at Manoa Road has a, a no truck sign. Uh, could never figure out why, because when any tr large truck comes down that hill and the bridge is so low, they really they can't go up Lawson because it's a narrow and winding road there. So it was uh, my estimation that we have to give an access for a truck to turn around, and it never made sense to why it said from uh, Manoa Road to the Upper Darby Township line. It made no sense at all. I, I saw I, I cleared it with Dr. Dr. Hart. We felt it was just the smarter thing to do. Instead of keeping a restriction in place that really has no bearing, we never enforce. Yeah, I was curious. Thank you. Thank you. Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. And Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item 11, resolution 2182-2020. Mr. D'Amelio. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion uh, to adopt resolution 2182-2020, authorizing David E. R. Berman, Township Manager, to enter into and, ex and execute an agreement with PA DOT electronic access for PA crash information. Second. Motion made and second. Want to explain that more? It's a police safe access, yeah. This is uh, an agreement to allow the police to have access to the state's crash data. Which will help with? Analyzing traffic uh, requests for stop signs and other devices. Why didn't we never have that before? We always have to get that. Have to renew oh. it occasionally. Very good. Thank you. Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. And Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item 12 is purchased. Uh, Mr. Dr. Mr. Hart. Mr. President, a motion to approve the purchase, installation, and replacement of the exterior front side doors in the amount of $15,950 to Sandley Access Technologies, Trent, New Jersey, submitting the lowest responsible bid. This is for the stadium and the front doors. Second. Motion made and second. Any questions on this? This is an important update to the stadium for control of humidity and moisture control, uh, mainly to control the humidity that gets in there. 
and it'll actually have a great effect on our environmental keeping the ice solid and reducing the amount of humidity in there uh, by with the new door system. Any other questions? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item 13. Mr. President, a uh, motion to award the abatement of the former Brookline Elementary School contract to Advanced Environmental Contractors, Philadelphia, PA, in the amount of $149,800, submitting the lowest responsible bid. Second. Motion made and second. Any questions on this? This is something we have to do no matter what we do with the building. Uh, we have to get rid of the asbestos and any other hazardous materials. Have to be abated before we could do any construction or demolishing. So this has to be done no matter what decision is ultimately made. And it's also true that most likely if we were to demolish it, the price would now be lower um, with the asbestos. When we did the uh, bids earlier in the year, those bids did include the removal of some of these hazardous materials. So that bid potentially would be lower. Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. South Ardmore parking lot improvements. Motion to award South Ardmore parking lot improvements contract to Premier Concrete Inc. Broomall PA in the amount of $116,925 submitting the lowest responsible bid funding from CDBG. Okay. Motion made and second by Mr. Oliva. Any questions on this? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Improvements to the federal school. Motion to formally reject bids for contract number R30, improvements to the federal school. Second. Motion made and seconded. I assume the bids were all. The bids were significantly lower than budgeted and. Um, higher. higher. The, the bids were significantly higher than budgeted. Okay. <laughs> the budget was significantly lower than the bids. And uh, we're going to look at rebidding that sometime in the fall. Great. Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Uh, yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Uh, number four. Bob, can I just ask for clarification? We, Mr. Solicitor, we need to formally vote to reject all bids on something? When we were rejecting all of them, yes. Thanks. Number 14 is a continuation of the Citizens Forum. We have no additional comments that have come in, Mr. Berman, I guess, so via email. Number 15 is any new business. Is there any new business by any commissioner? Seeing none. Other business? Mr. D'Amelio? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, I don't know about all of you. I think we'd love to rewind 2020 and start all over again. Hell of a six months so far. My condolences to Public Works and uh, on the death of uh, Kenneth Casey Berry, tragic death. And uh, we wish uh, we could do more for his family, but uh, I thank all your Public Works employees that have been out there working hard during this pandemic. I also want to thank their volunteer firefighters or EMTs, paramedics that are out there, Jim, every every day and helping our residents with the police department. And uh, thanks to the uh, police committee for meeting last month. I also want to thank uh, Mr. Berman and Joe Celia for helping me out with the gas station on Westchester Pike that had some issues there, and, uh, one of which uh, I think the DEP sent some fines to the gas station, is that correct, or a fine? The DEP sent the enforcement notice. Uh, they're bringing them into compliance. Uh, provided they come into compliance, there would be no citation. Okay. Thank you so much. 
for your help with that, Joe, you and Dave. And how about Bailey Park? Do we have an update on an email I sent to you earlier? Yes, I am. Um... You can come, please. Come up. Um, Mr. The, Mr. D'Amelio got an email from a resident saying that there was a lot of trash down at Bailey Park. I had been stopping down at Bailey Park last week because Bailey Park's an attraction for basketball players from all over. I wanted to see what the crowds were. I was down there on Saturday morning. It wasn't too bad. But I went down there this afternoon to see what it was like. I ended up cleaning up, and there was about 15 kids down there, and I explained to them that the neighbors were complaining about the trash, and they shouldn't be leaving it. They were pretty amenable to reasonable about it. And I said, if you don't do that, there's going to be some enforcement here that's going to pre prevent you from playing. So I talked to two different groups there and told them that they needed to clean up when they were done. But I was there. It was mostly water bottles around the players' benches. I cleaned it all up and told them that we needed them to clean up their own things. And it'll have to be something we'll have to stop down there regularly and talk to our grass crew when they're down there so that they see that they have to clean up that too. So, Brian, I've got, gotten a lot of calls about that too, about about the trash and one asked could we get like a sign or something to is that is that's been a lot a lot of trash up, up there is there. a couple cans right there yeah but it's, i don't know yeah. how effective sign is but sure we can put up a sign and say make sure you clean up after yourself mm -hmm. oh, great thank so, you clarify parks are open now yes okay. yes the basketball courts were open once we went into the green phase okay and they close at a certain time the basketball the lights go off there at 10 o'clock well, actually we have a, our light system works on a Egg timer between 7 and 10, if you're there, you can turn the lights on so they're not on if nobody's using them. But they'll go off at 10 no matter who's there. Apparently, John, there, there's complaints. I don't know if Kevin, you, uh, Connor, rather, if you're getting some complaints. The loud music at night, you know. By, by, by Bailey Park, I've got yes. a few of those, yeah. And I live so, right, right in the back of there. Yeah, so I, I mean, hear it too. residents say that uh, there's probably partying going on there and loud music and a lot of bell language and their kids, you know, hearing all this. So if we could just keep up with this a bit, it'd be great. I understand, look, I mean, people have, you know, they want to get out, and I get it. We, I don't know how anybody could hear it over the fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's right, right, right in the back of my house. I hear it well. <laughs> That's the worst thing this, this state ever did. Let people have these fireworks that are going off everywhere. But we have words for that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Could I? You want them? Is that it? I don't think so. Huh. Mr. Oliva. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, I'd like um, John to thank you very much for these uh, the changes in the uh, in the, the guidelines, uh, police officers. Um, I see that. Um, that the police department is actually policing itself and that's that's very good to see i'm very proud of our police department and um in in making some changes um to you know finding the time um i also um talked earlier and uh, and i'd like jim to speak about it if you could about the the sign at um lawrence and eagle road um, the Trump sign and why the um, or why it's there and no why it's because I'm getting a lot of complaints yeah about that sign yeah I I can't answer why it's there I mean I have an <laughs> idea why it's, it's there we all know why it's there. Um, but I um, you know uh, from what I understand and I have not seen the sign and at first I heard about it was tonight uh, that it's a a Trump sign is what it is and. Um, you know, whether it can be regulated or not. Uh, it's a very difficult question. I mean, um, our uh, political speech is the most protected uh, area of speech that we have under the First Amendment. Um, there are times when you can uh, regulate, you know, uh, time, place, um, and, and size of, of the signage, uh, but it's very difficult. Uh, I'll have to take a look at the sign, take a look at the case law, but I can tell you right now that, that, that um, and then I said this earlier tonight, and it's kind of a bad pun, but uh, the uh, Constitution generally trumps the uh, zoning ordinance. So, but I'll, I'll take a look at it. So, Jim, uh, just to be clear, so, you're, so what you're saying is if I wanted to put a lawn sign on my property out of the public right away for political purposes, whatever they might be, it could basically be any size. 
and I could light it? Um, I, I don't know that. I, I can't give you a blanket yes on that. I can give you a general um, answer that, that they're very difficult to regulate. Um, you, you can so you definitely we, can't ban them, and, and regulating them is very difficult. But we couldn't, so we're, we're undergoing the looking at all our ordinances, um, and in that exercise, could we not restrict um, size, the size of a sign on a residential property? Right. You know, whatever but, the number might be, some dimension there's, can't be lit yeah. because it's you know really the problem with these signs is it's not really fair to the neighbors who don't you know like don't like this particular sign right you know object to it right. or whatever the message might be. It's and, not so much the I, message; it's the fact that the sign is so large that it really is not. It's not good for the neighborhood. Yes, I, and, and I, I hear you, and I and I agree to most signs. I mean, there are different categories of signs and different types of signs. What I'm saying, though, is when you when you get into the political arena, that that really becomes a protected area. So, you know, if it was a sign that said, you know, "Happy Birthday" or something, you know, and, and then we might have a a better chance at regulating it. We may have a chance at, at doing something with this sign. I'm just trying to give you a heads up that it's really difficult with this type of sign. To regulate it, um, and um, you know, so you're saying even as we look at our uh, yeah, what a lot of towns do, you know, a lot of towns do is is they they, they regulate the signs and 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 then you know it's it's almost a, a hope that um, people will you know uh, not challenge you know appreciate their their, their neighbors you know and, and and not put a big giant sign up that's bothering the neighbors, but if the person chooses to fight against it. <clears throat> And you know, brings you down to the federal court with a First Amendment argument. It's a difficult case. I'm not saying you, you you can't win it, but I'm saying it's a difficult case. Well, I think we should start there as we look at our ordinances. We ought to start with that restriction and hope that people I'll take a look be considerate of their neighbors. Yes, Mr. Siegel. Mr. Siegel. Go ahead, Mr. Siegel. Um, we did look at that. I can tell you historically. A few years ago, yep. plus yep. a few years more when we actually revised the sign ordinance yep. a few years ago, that property uh, raised a lot of questions. I get more complaints about it than anything else in the ward um, when there were signs that weren't for a candidate, but were for another political issue that many found far more offensive than a sign for a candidate. And I know, I, and I can find the research that we felt that uh, in consultation with Mr. Burns' office that, it, that we were very limited despite, uh, you know, a display that many of us considered noxious, but the First Amendment does limit our ability. And the last thing we want to do is go into federal court, lose and be hit with attorney's fees over something. But it, it's, it, we concluded back then that we really, our hands were basically tied as long as it did not impact sight lines, public safety, et cetera. And in fact, at one point, the signs were closer to the street and were moved back after the, after the it's a business uh, was cited uh, for it. And historically, when we've tried to cite him, uh, he takes the, the anything that may be uh, potentially a violation down after 29 days and starts over again a day or two later. And Dan, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Didn't we, didn't we also, we used to regulate how long a political sign can be up and we realized that we could not do that. And in fact, I remember correct. this, I'm sorry. He said correct. said correct. Right. So, I mean, we, we, we more or less said that the sign can stay up, not that sign, but a political sign can stay up all, all the time. Yeah, well, well uh, now, you know, now let, me, let me finish. So I, I don't like the size of the sign. I mean, everyone has a right to put a candidate's sign on their lawn. I would agree that we should look into whether or not we can limit the size of the sign. As, or Dan, are you saying that that would not be possible? I think it depends. I mean, I can tell you last year, there were a lot of complaints, not just in Haverford, but in the county, when we had obviously a very uh, contested county-wide elections. And whether it was there were signs Republican and Democrat that were far larger within the township and elsewhere than ordinances, and no one uh, sort of wanted to address, 
try to address it because of the concern you might you may well lose the case law is not good for regulating political signs unless they're public safety issues you know yeah I my my office I mean we're really on top of signs I mean you know that we've we've represent a lot of different towns with respect to not only this type of signs but you know commercial signs and then that so we really have a pretty good feel for the cases on on signage and that's why I started out telling you that I think it's a very difficult case now you know and I know that we did revamp the ordinance with what we thought was the law at the time and I think it's still the law but what I I'm happy to do is take a look to see if there's been any new cases but I don't know of any that would really help us much more but but as far as safety Dan you brought up I mean the sign is being vandalized and it's I don't know if that's a safety issue or not but it could create some issue yeah are we looking into that too it's creating a lot of humor yeah I'm sorry it's creating great laughs I didn't know it is it is creating a lot of good laughs yeah I mean I like I said I'll take a look at the sign I'll take a look up update the cases but I just I don't want to get anybody's hopes up on it please Thank you, Mr. Burke. No one, no one is allowed to deface any yeah. opponent completely. Yeah, that's a, that's a different no, issue, though. I mean, and, and that's another one. They can have yeah. the Sorry, that nothing. Go ahead. Yeah. Bill asked me whether I had more, and I said yes. Oh, I'm sorry, but okay. you know, even stealing some people used to do that. Don't like right, right. Which is illegal, correct? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. It's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's still illegal. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's the end. I just want to make sure yeah, people are still legal. Because some, no, in all honesty, some people look at that as, as it's not no big deal. It's just part of the political game, but it's it's a crime. I guess it depends on whose signs you're stealing. Right? Okay, but that's <laughs> civil, <laughs> civil disobedience. Sure, leave it. I don't go ahead. Right. So uh, I was I received a phone call earlier um, uh, earlier in the week about a uh, a lawn sign again that was. Um, marked as as one as the person pulled it. it was it was scary to think that in this township somebody puts out a lawn sign and his house is marked um so i would urge everyone to um to put out whatever lawn sign you want to on your lawn right within regulation um <laughs> are, are any. as we don't know what that is but um, but don't be afraid to put out what you feel. That your First Amendment right um, is is paramount to us, and to uh, and I think that anybody who does anything like that um, should be prosecuted. Um, it's it's not anybody should be able to to, to put out what they want within reason. Um, so I I was. Um, I was taken back by the phone call, and I, uh, I told the gentleman to call the police, and uh, and and he did. And uh, I drove by his house today on my way here just to make sure, and his lawn sign is still up. So um, I am I'm glad to see that that it is, and that everybody uh, is able to put up whatever they want. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. McCluskey. Uh. Yeah, I just, uh, every, I think the township is doing the best it can to continue with business as, as close to normal as possible, and I commend everybody in the township um, for doing that. And I want the residents to know that we're, we're, by all means, trying to continue with, you know, their zoning applications and permit applications and everything that the township normally provides, you know, public works, picking up your trash twice a week. We're trying to do everything as safely as, as possible. Um, but every call, every email any of us get, the, the, the underlying and the ultimate, you know, the, the ultimate backbone to all of it is that uh, we all have to make sure that we stay in the green phase. So I just encourage every resident to, con to continue practicing social distancing, to wear your masks, to wear your mask, to wear your mask. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's what we have. We, we need to, I, I think we're seeing in the news and in every other part of the country that if you open up too quickly, um, it's not gonna go away magically. So please uh, help us keep Hereford Township in the green zone, because that's the only way kids go back to school, that's the only way people go back to work, that's the only way, um, you know, there's football, that's the only way anything happens in the fall. So. Uh, we're all in this together, so please wear your mask. Thank you. 
Mr. Siegel. said, um, you know, we've, we've lost a number of residents in the township, many of whom I knew. Um, and as you can see, I'm still erring on the side of uh, conservatism with uh, the situation. Uh, please protect yourselves, protect each other. That's the best way we can come out of this um, healthy and our families and friends healthy. Um, and I hope to see all of you next month in person. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Lewis. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, highlight uh, the Fifth Ward resident and uh, Bryn Mawr, the college professor, and two of his students are putting forth a what I think to be a pretty exciting uh, public-private partnership uh, to try to fund the purchase of solar panels for the crack in the skadium. Uh, some commissioners may already be familiar with this because I think they've presented to the EAC. Um, but the tax benefits uh, would not benefit, obviously, the township. Um, they would benefit a private partnership. And I understand those tax benefits uh, have, I guess, go away in 2022, if, I, if, I, if I'm understanding it correctly. So there's some, still some financial incentive in the private sector to fund solar panels. So their thinking is to try to put together a private a public partnership um, to, to have the partnership purchase the solar panels at their expense and then lease um, the crack in the skadium uh, rooftops for, for uh, solar panels and then uh, come back come back to the township with um, hopefully a, a, a very competitive uh, power rate or you know less than less than we might be able to buy it competitively um, and then whatever excess power is produced would be sold at the grid so it could be it could be a pretty exciting uh, partnership. I don't see it as overly attractive for investors, but uh, I think uh, I think there are investors out there that are interested in in helping their community and and seeing you know a, a better environment and supporting a better environment. So I think they're willing to take uh, take some risk and probably see less of a return. Uh, so I think it's a pretty um, as I said exciting project that. I think as a township, we should we should pursue, um, and unless there's an objection from anybody on the board, I would like like to ask our solicitor just to just look at it quickly to see if there's anything you know from a legal perspective that might be a roadblock to the formation of such a public-private partnership. Andy, um, yes, correct. We have hydropower there, right? There's geothermal. Geothermal, there. rather. Geothermal, sorry. Just the heating and cooling. Heating and cooling, not electrical. Not electrical. Okay. Then I, yeah, good. Jim, is that does it? Yeah, it's, it, it's. I'm happy to do it. Um, there, you know, it, it, well, uh, you know, public-private partnerships are encouraged, and, and especially in the area of energy and things, um, there are some regulations that we have to make sure that we don't go afoul of with respect to um, the, the project that we're doing. So I would need to take a look at what the proposal was and compare it with, you know, the different statutes to see whether, whether we, we can do it. I mean, can we just authorize you to do it? I'm for it. We need to vote on it. I think the township manager can authorize Yeah, the, the township manager could authorize me, but I just, yeah. you know. Yeah, and then Thank also uh, they're looking for, um, uh, I talked to Dr. Uh, Dene uh, last week about this, and he would like to, um, you know, we're pursuing people that can provide some expertise to this project, whether it be legal, accounting, um, you know, these purchase agreements, these kind of things that can actually help kind of formulate the, you know, how, how this is going to work. I mean, conceptually, it makes a lot of sense. But then you have to get down into the details and how is this going to really work and how is the township going to benefit, how the taxpayer is going to benefit, how the investors are, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be a win-win situation for all parties. Otherwise, it's not going to work, obviously. So. Uh, so there's a lot of details to work out. So I'd urge anybody that has any knowledge or wants to participate in this in this project, uh, this, this this really at the feasibility stage, to you know, let me know or let Dave Berman know or let the president know or one of your commissioners know uh, that you have the expertise to you might be able to help in this uh, in this feasibility phase. So Andy, and yes. just today the EAC they're going to do a presentation to the EAC. 
on solar. in the next couple of weeks, and then they hope to fine tune that to do a presentation to the board maybe in August or something. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, I forgot to raise that. Thank you, Doctor. He said that to me as well. So hopefully the board might be receptive um, to hearing from that uh, that from, Doc, from Victor Dene and his students um, sometime in August or September, whenever they feel they're ready. By Zoom, I assume. Um, but thank you, Doctor. That's all Thanks. I have, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. Um, uh, first, I want to thank uh, I, I want to thank our chief and our deputy chief for uh, publishing the uh, police department's um, uh, latest um, uh, latest decision and and determinations as to how to address a lot of people's concerns about the police. And uh, as John said, but it may not have been very obvious to everybody hearing, some of these things are new, some of these things are beefed up versions of, of stuff they've already done, but some of these things have already been the policy of, of, of Haverford's PD. So I appreciate the effort that you've gone to, um, and I appreciate that you're going to publish this. I think this is going to give uh, some people a great deal of comfort who are concerned um, just generally specifically here about what they perceive sometimes as the different police departments uh, uh, reluctance maybe to make to make moves in this direction. Um, I know in the fall, John, there's going to be pressure on the board from uh, from within the board as well as from people now with new perspectives about policing. There's probably going to be a great deal of questions about the budget, I would suggest. Um, uh, not that you prepare for changes as much as you just prepare for questions. Explain to people how much of our budget is really about our cost of personnel, how little of our budget is uh, uh, is what people would call, you know, military style hardware. Um, but but be prepared for those questions from us on the board as well as I think people in the public. Um, and speaking of the public, it uh, I want to thank Public Works who've tried throughout this pandemic to uh, still maintain um, excellent staffing and respond to all the things that have happened, you know, in the township we've had in addition to the pandemic, we've certainly had, you know, lousy weather um, and other events and uh, response from the Public Works Department has really uh, been terrific. And um, in the Sixth Ward in particular, but it seems all throughout the township, there's a great deal of construction going on right now. And I just would uh, tell everybody in the township, but in particular, I want to ask everybody in the Sixth Ward who's dealing with the unexpected closure of Wynwood Road um, and some of the other projects that are going on to please, please be careful, especially um, right now while so many people are home. Our neighborhoods are much more crowded during the day than they typically would be when people are at work and kids were at camps or something like that. So please be very careful as you go through these detours and you start cutting through the neighborhoods you think you know, um, you don't know every kid there, you don't know every family there. So please, please drive carefully and drive slowly through that. I wanna thank the police department and the township uh, and the county for uh, the excellent information and constant stream of information that's being provided. Uh, our social media pages and on the website pages, it's been very helpful uh, for our constituents and have it for Township to have immediate access to good information. I encourage everybody um, to go to the best sources of the information for where we are in the latest phases of this pandemic. Um, and that would be the county, that would be our township, and it would also be our police department. Um, and then finally, I just want to say this is the time of the year where we would often have proclamations uh, for students who did something very special, our high school students, some of our college graduates, even some of our grade school students. Um, and I look forward to when we all are able to, you know, reconvene here and we can do those, uh, do those proclamations for those students in the fall, or whatever it is that we finally have these restrictions uh, lifted. There are uh, constituents of mine as well as constituents of all of us on this board. Um, who do deserve um, some, uh, some heralding of their accomplishments in the last year, especially under these circumstances. And I look forward to us being able to do that in person for folks, I hope, in the fall, fingers crossed. So um, that is all I have. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Commissioner Quinn. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, I would like to uh, 
thank uh, the chief. I get call, the, call, the calls every week to thank you and uh, your source for, uh, for, uh, for everything you do to keep this uh, town um, safe. And uh, I've been getting lot, lots of calls because there's more cars on the road and everybody cuts through now. So, mm -hmm. so just, to, uh, just to tell everybody, when you go down streets, don't speed like you would speed on the other road. Well, don't speed, period, period. But, um, and uh, um, Brian, Brian thank, thank you for your, for, uh, uh, to address the bail, 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 or, 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 or bail, the Bailey Park thing. And um, it's just great to be back here. Let's get this year done. And, <laughs> and I got blamed that, 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 or, or uh, that ever since I joined this board, things have, yeah, so. <laughs> That's so thanks, guys. He'll just kind of join. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Thank you, Commissioner. Dr. Hart. Um, yeah, just everyone, um, stay healthy. Keep your neighbors healthy. Uh, practice the three W's. Wash your hands. Watch your distance. Wash your, and... Wear masks, wear masks, wear masks. Stay well. Thank you. I'd just like to thank all the departments. We've done it. I think the township has done a great job during this, this pandemic. Before we adjourn, I'd like to ask, I'd like to ask everybody here in the room to please stand. At this time, I'd like to offer a moment of silence for our employee and fellow township uh, employee, uh, Ken Burry. KC is, he was affectionately known down in our public works department one of our best mechanics uh, that passed away this past month in a, in a tragic accident at the yard. So please join me. Thank you very much. We stand adjourned.